Hi, and welcome back to Regaining the Balance. Today we're going to be reading out of a, a uh, book that is going to be related to some of the other stuff that we've been uh, reading, um, particularly the Hermetic texts and a bunch of other things. And the crazy part about this book is that um, you find examples of it all over the place in history. So um, one of the, and so the book is called The Philosophy of Fire, and it is a book by uh, Rosicrucians, or I should say American Rosicrucians for that matter, um, and uh, it's very interesting, and very enlightening, I will say, because um, everybody's seen, uh, when we're reading this, and they'll, they'll point this thing out, um, I've already read this book once here. And I thought that it was worth bringing it to you guys. So I'm going to be reading the entire book. I got about 25 to 30 minutes here that, uh, of time that I can just straight go through whatever I can. Hopefully I'll get through maybe the first chapter or so. Um, but uh, And I also have a drink, so from time to time I will need to wet my whistle, just to let you guys know. So, let us... Let us... Check this place out here. Okay, here we go. All right, the philosophy of fire. The philosophy of fire underlies all true initiation as well as the secret doctrine and ancient mysteries. It is likewise the foundation upon which are built all mystic and occult fraternities, the ideal republic and the brotherhood of man. You know, we have this guy here, a little try thing, okay. And this is by R. Swinburne Clymer, M.D., author of Rosicrucians, Their Teachings, Alchemists, the Divine Alchemy, etc., etc. Um, I've read a couple of his other books, and they're all pretty good. They're all a little different. This one, though, is this one's special. <laughs> I will just say that. So we're going to read the preface to the third edition and then get into, uh, I'm not sure if there's an introduction or not, but we'll, we'll just plow through this thing, so. Thank you for joining me today, I just wanted to say, and if uh, you guys like the content that um, I and my wife bring to you guys, um, please consider donating. Um, we have our PayPal, and eventually we'll have our uh, um, Patreon thing listed at the bottom. So uh, without further ado, preface to the third edition. The first edition of Philosophy of Fire was issued in 1905 and sold within a few months of its publication. The second edition, rewritten and very much enlarged, appeared in 1907, which is the one we are currently reading, I'm not mistaken, it was well received and highly endorsed by students of the mysteries and higher occult. Since the issues of this last edition, times have greatly changed and opinions have undergone a mental evolution, revolution and... Problems and subjects formerly tabooed and shunned by educated classes are now being freely discussed. All this we had in mind while rewriting Philosophy of Fire for its third edition, permitting us to give a clearer exposition of the fire philosophy under, underlying all religions, and likewise to, the extensively, to extensively hint at the material basis underlying the teaching and training in the secret schools of the ancients. Many well-informed readers have labored under the impression that these schools had in mind merely the greater physical and higher mental development of its neophytes, forgetting for the moment if they actually ever knew that in ancient times when the greater initiates ruled and ruled wisely, even those royally born could not become kings unless they had been fully trained and thoroughly educated in these schools. These rulers were termed the initiate kings, and while in power the people prospered and were protected in their liberties. It was only after the greater church became degraded and other than initiate kings ruled that the masses were exploited by the classes. Nevertheless, through the ages intervening between glorious Egypt of 5,000 years ago and the present, many of the world's greatest leaders, general statesmen, and even kings and presidents have been taught statesmanship in these schools, which have continued a silent and secret existence up to the present moment. Having made this claim without any reservation whatsoever, we whatever, we propose to give a short outline of the advantage, advantages spiritual instructions and training has for the true seeker, and to follow this with a statement expressing the opinions of the schools of the ideal republic and how it may be established. There are two methods of gaining knowledge. The one is that of the material school, the method and study of experiences of others, and memorizing both the method and the conclusions reached. 
This is superficial to a degree, because it depends entirely upon memory and belief, which can be turned into an actual knowledge through experience. But the majority do not go that far, being willing to take for granted as truth that which others have concluded to be truth. The other method is that of developing the inner or spiritual faculties, thereby awakening the intuitive powers through which both the means and conclusions may be reached, often instantaneously, either through feeling or sensing or by actual visual visualization and living for the moment the thing which is to be known. Through this process, at first difficult and uh, through this process, at first difficult and painful, with possible after effects, one may place oneself in the position of another undergoing certain trials and suffer all the tortures such are in, all the tortures such are enduring. An easily comprehensible example is that of watching one with physical pain, which such intensity as to forget the self, and during such time the watcher experiences all the pain and reflects on his own features and the agony depicted on the face of the actual sufferer. The adherent of the material school relies entirely on the physical senses and on a mental retention of the thing heard, while the spiritualist, in parentheses, uh, word used in its real sense, close parentheses, retires to the source of all things and there obtains the information desired through what might be termed, quote, absorption, unquote, or the coming into communion with, quote, all that is, unquote. By this statement, we do not wish to indicate the student in the secret school should not take up the studies as outlined by the material schools of the day. On the contrary, we emphatically state that for the welfare of humanity in general, the youth should acquire a thorough education by attending public school, college, and university. But with this regular or routine education, he should not forget that the other he should not forget that the other side, the real side of his being, nor the neglect or nor neglect its development. In other words, to be able while following a systematic course of education, to follow a system of spiritual training and development, thus rounding out his, quote, four square, unquote, being. Um, I'm going to be getting into uh, a really great book by Carl Jung, which is going to explain this idea of the four square um, in, in breathtaking detail. <laughs> Continuing, heretofore it is... It has been the belief of all but a few, possibly due to the impression left on the readers of the books dealing with the subject, that the secret schools taught man to find his own soul, to purify the heart so, that, so as to throb with love for all humanity and through the awakening of intuition, to hold the keys to nature's laws, thereby enabling him to accomplish his desires. All this is true insofar as the spiritual nature of man is concerned, but the secret schools have also always had in mind the betterment of physical humanity, and have been the relentless foes of autocrats, oligarchs, potentates, and of oppression in every form, teaching an ideal code of ethics for the establishment of an ideal democracy, not through revolution, but by evolution, and that the true, lasting republic be the outgrowth of granting equal rights to all men, special privileges to none. As previously stated, we believe the time is Propitious, propitious for the secret schools to give a clear outline of what they have taught and still teach on the rights of man. All men are born free, but not equal. It would be both foolish and illogical to claim all men are equal when born. This inequality is both physical and mental. The child born of healthy parents who themselves are obedient to the rules of hygiene and physical development, who live in harmony in, with, in, with creative laws, is certainly blessed with a more perfect and stronger physique than the child born to parents and the slums who know nothing whatever of hygiene, physical development, or creative laws. It must and is freely admitted that there are exceptions to this rule, but we state the general law. Eh, not so sure if I agree with that. Likewise, the child born to parents who are mentally developed, a sound education of a moderately brilliant atta attainment is, in most cases, better equipped mentally and certainly with greater incentive to become than the child of parents who are ignorant and of low mental development. Again, I don't really, you know, I mean, I understand what they're saying here. I'm digressing here from the, from the, from the book. <laughs> I mean, I, I get what they're saying, but I think, you know, the idea that any person, like, you, you know, he, like up here it says that all men are born free, any person can take up this, could take up their path in life and go in the direction that they're talking about, so... But I get what they're saying. It's just it's like sometimes people are born with, uh, 
more physical and societal and various other challenges than others. So in some cases, it's, you know, people in certain places are going to be easier to um, assimilate this stuff than others. So anyways, going on. However, though men are not born equal, all men should have equal opportunity in all respects. I agree with that. That, it, this, that this may become a possibility the secret schools believe in the establishment of schools of education which will permit every young man and woman, no matter how poor materially, the same opportunity for education, professional or scientific training as the children of the rich. God, can you imagine what kind of society we'd have if that's the kind of education we have right now besides our Rockefeller, DuPont, <laughs> oligarchical education system we all have? Continuing, such institutions would undoubtedly require the aid of the state, but as it is a notor as no as it is a notoriously well known fact that the sons and daughters of the middle class are better equipped both mentally and physically to become successes in life if given a fair chance than many of the sons and daughters of the ultra rich, it behooves the state to quickly arrange for such educational institutions. Good luck with that one. All men, whether great or small, rich or poor, should be granted equal right for the protection of the person, which non-interference one with the other, unless one become a menace to the other. All men, whether rich or poor, weak or strong, the right of fair trial and be guaranteed justice. The poor man to be protected by the state of which he is a citizen and not left to the mercy of those rich in worldly goods. All men should be guaranteed equal rights of development, advancement, and religious freedom, a toleration of his beliefs, no matter what they may be, so long as he does not interfere with the beliefs or non-beliefs of his fellow man. <clears throat> Excuse me. An ideal state cannot exist if there is one law for the rich, another for the poor, one for the strong, and another for the weak. The weak must be protected by the state until they gain strength, while the strong and the rich shall not be considered guilty merely because of their strength or their possessions. The ideal state can only exist when the honest possessions of wealthy of the wealthy are protected against aggression, and on the contrary, the rights of the worker are protected by laws against the exploitation by the strong or the wealthy. Okay. Unquestionably, in the past, there were numberless kings, emperors, potentates, presidents, and employers of the laboring classes who were tyrannical, taking every advantage of the masses, giving them no more in return than absolutely necessary. This is true today, although in a lesser degree. It is equally true that throughout the ages there were many kings, emperors, potentates, presidents, kings of kings of finances, and employers of labor who were just in every respect who were just in every respect, who had the welfare of the people at heart. More such men exist today than ever before. All fair minded men admit that the majority of men in the past who possessed wealth or ruling power were in a degree tyrannical, using such wealth or authority to either exact heavy toll from the less fortunate, just making sure you guys can see this, uh, sorry, yes, to exact a heavy toll from the less fortunate or to demand obedience to established though often unrighteous and unjust laws. This is equally true today because many men vested with a little brief authority dearly love to display it and do not have the strength of character to be just and impartial to rich and poor, honored and disgraced alike. However, the honored, the strong, and the wealthy have not been the only ones to show gross injustice to, to their fellow men. The poor, the workers, the masses have been equally guilty, nay, doubly unjust toward the rich and the strong, and to their companions in misery and servitude. This is actually truer today than, it even, than even before in the history of the world. What an interesting statement. <laughs> An assertion from, of this nature should not be vo voiced unless there is ample proof for it. Moreover, proof should be furnished with, this, with the statement. Thus, let us, let us consider the laborers, the class belonging to the unions, in their relation to one another. As an example, we select the contract carpenter who has in his employ 25 men. At best, not more than five of these are master jointers. There is a call for five, five men to do some building. The contractor selects and grades them so that no more than five, one of the five is a master mechanic. 
The one requiring the services of these carpenters must accept the men selected, except, uh, parentheses, except in rare cases, close parentheses. He must pay the same rate for the services of the unskilled he pays for that of the expert. And the man who does less than half as much, and there are always such in every company, work as the expert and unable, work as the expert and unable to do perfect work, receive the same wages as the expert. If the laborer cannot be just to his fellow worker and is likewise unjust to the employer, forcing him to pay the same wages for unskilled services, he pays for master workmanship. How can he expect justice from the ruling class, the strong and the wealthy? The plea may reasonably be advanced that the workers were compelled to form unions for their self-protection against exploitation by the classes. Even if we were perfectly willing to admit this, it does not excuse the destructive practices of the wage scale which allow the expert, a member of a union, no more than the, in, the novice and slacker, many workers are such even after many years of experience, because the latter also belongs to the union. There is a great injustice practiced by those in authority, those who are strong and wealthy, but they are in the minority. There is an infinite greater wrong done by the masses, the workers, against the classes, and especially against each other, because they are in the majority. This, this is very interesting points here. I mean, I, I, I really, I, I, I get what he's saying. And I think if you look at pictures of buildings from the 1800s and the exquisite architecture and the artwork that went into these things, which is strange because the, supposedly they built them and then 20 years later, later they had to tear them all down because of, you know, whatever. Uh, it, today, like, you you see these buildings and it's just, everything is sterile. They're all just rectangular glass and concrete buildings. There's nothing art about any of this. They want to call it postmodernism or whatever else, architecture or whatever, and, or modern architecture. It's garbage. It, it inspires nothing, okay, but sterility. And I can see what he's saying here because when I think that one of the things about the old style and the guilds back in the day is that they, at the very least, when they accepted people into their guilds, you know, wouldn't allow them to be um, a larger part of the bigger projects unless they became masters. And so, you know, and, and in that way they preserve their their knowledge and also their skill throughout their workers. And I think he has a good point here. When you have people who really don't care, then what you have is slowly and slowly the, the, the artistry of, of all of these types of things kind of go by the wayside. All right, we're going back to the book here. The secret schools believe in absolute justice and cannot recognize an injustice, just merely because it is committed by one in power or by those possessing power or wealth nor on the excuse the deed is done by one of the masses or by one seeking freedom from unfair conditions. Justice recognizes neither person or condition. She stands squarely for the right. The ideal state will jealously guard the rights and the welfare of the unborn. <sighs> Good luck there. <laughs> no state can long exist and look with favor on the, illegit on the illegitimately born, but the state can establish just laws preventing the birth of such by recognizing the child born out of wedlock as possessing both father and mother and by visiting severe punishment upon the father in the form of legally recognizing him as the father and forcing him to perform all duties a natural loving father would perform. Countless millions of children were born before a marriage ceremony existed. Can we believe all such were damned by God, whom we believe to be a loving father? Good question. If they were not damned, then certainly he does not visit punishment upon the child born out of wedlock today, for it was not in position to prevent the wrong. For this reason, it behooves the state to be just and protect it against the wrong of its inhuman creator and grant the equal rights our free constitution provides all men in which an ideal state might grant for all for, or fall to its doom. So basically it's saying that, you know, if a child is born and the father's not in the picture like sort of like child support in some way but this is going a little farther here because it talks about the loving the uh all the natural all the duties a natural loving father would perform so i.e they would actually have to be a father not just a paycheck 
Um, and I, I know, I can't say that I disagree with that. You know, all kids need both. It's really important for the development of any children, all children, to have two sides of, of that. Or, you know, but even then, like, even if there isn't anything and, and you guys are same-sex couples or something like that, it still requires two people. It's like a balancing thing. You know what I mean? Like, um, and I think children really require that. In, uh, they need different experiences so that they can understand, um, get a little, at least, imprints of what it's like to live in this dualistic world of ours. <laughs> we do not bespeak free love. We do not bespeak free love in any sense of that word. On the contrary, we ask for the most rigorous laws to protect the sacredness of marriage and the home. Secret schools believe in the fourfold development of man, the refinement and awakening of consciousness of body, mind, spirit, and soul. They believe in and teach the bringing into consciousness of the God spark, quote, ye are the temples of the living God, unquote, in man, that he may be thereby recognized his divine birthright the higher development of body of both his body and intellect, and finally the equal rights of all men born of woman and the ideal state. There we go. Fraternally Injustice, Mr. Swainberg Clymer, our author. And the introduction for the first edition. There is nothing new under the sun, and you guys are going to hear that all the time. <laughs> we believe it was co co Halef, one of the greatest teachers of the ancient mysteries who is given credit for first making this remark, though it is possible even he had quoted from some other master of the ancient school. Mary Corelli, the most justly famous author of the present day in her book, quote, A Romance of Two Worlds, unquote, says, quote, Yours? Why? What can you call your own? Every talent you have, every breath you draw, every drop of blood flowing in your veins is lent to you only. You must pay it all back. And as far as the arts go, it is as it is a bad sign of a poet, painter, and musician who is arrogant enough to call his work his own. It never was his and never will be. It is planned by a higher intelligence than his, only he happens to be the hired laborer, chosen to carry out the conception, sort of a mechanic in whom boastfulness looks absurd. As absurd as if one of the stonemasons working at the cornice of a cathedral were to vaunt himself as the designer of the whole edifice. And then a work, any work, is completed, it passes out of the laborer's hand, belongs to the age and the people from whom it was accomplished, and if deserving, goes on belonging to the future ages and future peoples. Unquote. Thus, with the book now placed before the reader, I wish him to remember that I do not call it mine. I have merely taken the works of many of those who have labored in this special field before me, have endeavored to choose such material, and arrange it in such form as to create a harmonious whole. Even this material of which I have made use was seldom original with the author from whom I quote. For instance, the secret doctrine has come down the ages to us, no one being able to give us even an idea as to the time when the mysteries were first taught to mankind. These mysteries were handed down by initiate to initiate, sometimes taught in schools established for that purpose, at other times and more often taught secretly and in places little suspected as being the seats of learning or the caves of intuition or in initiation. The question may logically be asked by the reader, why is it necessary to repeat the things which have already been written? It is a reasonable question and requires a frank answer. Quote, it is for the reason that many of those who give their attention to these doctrines and in their writings quoted from them did so in a negative form. It is our desire to treat these subjects in a most positive manner, dealing only with the facts as we know them. Truths that can be verified by, quote, him who truly seeks to know, unquote. In numerous instances, the authors from whom quoted states state the things which they had either heard or read, not belonging to end of the fraternities or secret schools in which the doctrines or philosophies are taught. Having no access to the secret records, they have been unable to vouch for the truth or the falsity of the claims made. Fully aware of the keen interest now taken by countless numbers in the secret science higher occultism, mysticism, and higher development known as initiation, having the records at my command which prove the things herein written to be true and beyond contradiction, I have ample reason and, no, and offer no excuse for the compilation of the present work. 
I do not wish to be accused of plagiarism, therefore I make these statements. I do not claim that a single line in this book is my own, though in many instances the interpretation given must be placed wholly to my personal responsibility. If the reader does find anything original or of value, let him give credit to those who I honor as my instructors. By doing so, you will give honor to whom it is due. I do ask the reader to remember this. Whatever is herein written is absolutely true. And if you are willing to so change your life and to become worthy, you will be able to find those who are able and ready to teach you to indicate the path leading to initiation, the finding of the soul, the Christ in you. History informs us, as soon as mankind recognized the, rela the relation existing between themselves and a creator and acknowledged moral responsibility for their acts to a supreme moral government, then religion became a pertinent fact, and systems of religious practices were introduced, whereby, in an objective form, their a subjectivity could be outwardly made manifest. These, symptom these systems are divided into monotheism and polytheism. The latter includes dualism and tritheism, the lowest grade of polytheism is fetishism, or idolatry, which teaches the worship of inanimate objects, sticks, stones, and the work of the hands of men. Next is pyrolatry, or worship of fire, and sabiism, worship of the sun. Quote, the first step of past masters or reformers was to receive a mission and elevation from some god. Thus, Amasis and Menevis lawgivers of the Egyptians receive their laws from Mercury, Thoth, Zoroaster of the Bactrians, Zamolzis, lawgiver of the Get Gettys, from Vesta, Zathrostis of the um, Armaspi, from a good spirit or genius, and all taught the doctrine of the, quote, law of karma, unquote, as the only just and equal, equal, equable to all men. There is no doubt that all of them were initiates of the secret schools then existing, wherein were taught the secret doctrines and ancient mysteries, the right of every man to, uh, to opportunity and justice, and the mystery of the philosophy of fire. Radamanthus and Minos, lawgivers of Crete, and Phoenicians, by the way, and Lycoan and Arcadia had intercourse with Jupiter. Triptolemus of Athens was inspired by Ceres, Pythagoras, another Phoenician, and Zaleucus for the Crotanians and Locrians ascribed their institution to Minerva. Lysurgus, Lysurgus of Sparta acted by direction of Apollo, and Romulus and Numa of Rome put themselves under the guidance of Consus and the goddess Egeria. The first Chinese monarch was called, quote, unquote, and I'm sorry about the word here, but Fag Four, the son of heaven, interesting. <laughs> Tusco, the founder of the German nations, was sent to reduce mankind from their savage and bestial life to one of order and society as signified by his name, which interpreted means, quote, interpreter of the gods, unquote. Thor and Odin, lawgivers of the Western Goths, laid claim to inspiration and to divinity, and they had given the names of the two days of the week. The constant epithets to kings in Homer are Diog Diogenesis, quote, horn of the gods, unquote, in Diotrephesis, Trephes, quote, bred or tor tutored by the gods, unquote. When true initiation is once more understood by scholars, they will no longer deny that man can actually be taught by God or supreme intelligence. Such is possible. Divine revelation to man or to the mind and the soul of man is not so difficult as one might imagine. Therefore, it cannot be questioned whether these masters or reformers receive their instructions directed from God through development and initiation, because man can come into direct communication with his God if he is willing to live the life, making such communion and instruction possible. Plutarch in his, quote, Isis and Osiris, unquote, say, Quote, it was a most ancient opinion derived as well by lawgivers as by divines that the world was not made by chance. Neither did one cause govern neither did one cause govern all things without opposition. Unquote. This is likewise a doctrine of Zoroaster, in which we, which were taught two opposite principles whereby the world was governed. 
The first religion or initial mysteries were those of Atlantis, known as the Hermetic philosophy. Remember that. <laughs> Later we find the Oriental mysteries of Isis and Osiris in Egypt. These were the same mysteries as the Hermetic philosophy of Atlantis, merely under a different name. The study of the mysteries of Isis and Osiris will quickly prove to the student that this was the pure fire philosophy. Zoroaster brought these mysteries into Persia, Cadmus, another Phoenician, and Inachus into Greece at large, Orpheus, uh, who has Phoenician overtones all over the place, into Thrace, and Melampsus into Athens. As these ancient mysteries were to Isis and Osiris in Egypt, so they were to Mithras in Asia, Asia in Samothrace, to the mother of the gods in Boetia, to Bacchus in Cyprus, to Venus in Crete, to Jupiter in Athens, to Ceres in Prosepine in Amphura, to Castor in Pollux in Lemnos, to Vulcan. The most noted of these were the Orphic, Bacchic, Eleusinian, Eluzi wow, all three of those, um, well, at least the Orphic and Bacchic one, they're very Phoenician-related. Uh, Samothracian, Kabiric, oh my goodness, again, and Myth Mithraic. It was agreed by Origen and Celsus that the mysteries taught the immortality of the soul, the law of karma, and also the law of reincarnation. All three of those things, okay. El the, the immortality of the soul, the law of karma, and also the law of reincarnation are the crux of the philosophical infighting of early Christianity and why they killed so many people because of these three ideas. <laughs> Just want to put the, point that out, okay, before I continue, because a lot of the uh, studies that I'm going to be bringing to you guys is really going to illuminate that big time. It was taught in them that the initiate would be happier than other mortals because he had so lived in this world as to learn in the present incarnation what it would be a necess necessary necessitate the pro profane what, what it would necessitate the profane many incarnations to comprehend oh I see what they're saying so uh, let me go let me go back I butchered that it was taught in them that the initiate would be happier than other mortals because he had so lived in this world as to learn in the present incarnation what it would necessitate the profane many incarnations to comprehend and what they mean by the profane is the masses of sleeping people out there, spiritually sleeping people. That's what they mean. People who would read this and, and all of this would go right over their heads. The mysteries taught the mysteries taught it was the design of initiation to restore the soul to that state whence it fell, as from its native seat of perfection. Epictetus taught as follows. Quote, thus the mysteries become useful. Thus we seize the true spirit of them when we begin to apprehend that every man therein was instituted by the ancients for instruction and amendment of life. Unquote. All who desire to become candidates for initiation into any of these mysteries were required to produce evidence of their fitness by due inquiry into their previous life and character. The Eleusinian stood open to none who did not approach the gods with a pure and holy worship, which was originally an indispensable condition observed in common, in common in all the mysteries, and instituted by Bacchus or Osiris himself, who would initiate none but virtuous and pious men. And it was required to have a prepared purity of mind and disposition, as previously ordered in the sacrifices or in prayers in approaching the mysteries. Max Muller wrote thus, quote, In the language of mankind in which everything new is old, and everything old is new, oh my, an exo inexhaustible mind has been discovered for researches of this kind. Now, I'm just going to uh, stop real quick and add a, a quick, this, I'm going to reread this. In the language of mankind in which everything new is old, and everything old is new, an inexhaustible mind has been discovered for researchers of this kind. Now you think about this, and what they're telling you, and you think about these ideas, and what people, how people label these ideas today as new age, okay? And I'm all, I'm going to show you that it is definitely not new, and it is extremely ancient. And uh, I find it very interesting that people can just take a wide brush and be like, oh, new age, or oh, 
the CIA looked into something because of blah, blah, blah. Well, you think that the CIA and uh, various governments who would want to use mind control aren't going to try to figure out what some of these key elements are of these ancient philosophies and understandings of the way the mind and spirit work? Of course they would. And it's obvious that they would. And, it's, and if you really look at that the way that they try to do it, they used force, coercion, and violence to get what they wanted because they don't have the patience and uh, to do it any other way. And because the other, the other way is through love and not, not through torture and violence. And, uh, you know, so just keep that in mind because a lot of people are going to scoff at this and I totally get it. But there, there are a lot of truths in this book that you're not going to hear in a whole lot of other books. So, continuing. Language still bears the impress of the earliest thoughts of man, obliterated, it may be, buried under new thoughts, yet here and there still recoverable in their sharp original outline. The growth of language is continuous, and by continuing our researches backwards from the most modern to the most ancient strata, the very elements and roots of human speech have been reached, and with them the elements and roots of human thought. What lies beyond the beginnings of language, however interesting it may be to the philologist, does not yet belong to the history of man, in the true and original sense of that word. Man means the thinker, and the first manifestation of thought is speech. But more surprising than the continuity of the growth of language is the continuity in the growth of religion. Of religion as of language, it may be said that in everything new is old, and everything old is new, and that there has been no entirely new religion since the beginning of the world. The elements and roots of religion were there as far back as we can trace the history of man, and the history of religion, like the history of language, shows us through a succession of new combinations of the same radical elements. An intuition of God, a sense of human weakness and dependence, a belief in the divine government of the world, a distinction between good and evil, and a hope for a better life. These are some of the radical elements of all religions. Though sometimes hidden, they rise again and again to the surface. Though frequently distorted, they tend again and again to their perfect form, though always under another name, Saint August, always by another name. St. Augustine himself, in accordance with this idea, said, quote, what is now called the Christian religion has existed among the ancients and was not just it was not absent from the beginning of the human race until Jesus came in the flesh, from which time the religion which existed already began to be called Christian. Unquote. That is a very telling quote from the, one of the church's highest esteemed, uh, you know, saints. The underlying principles in all true religions is the philosophy of fire. The very foundation of the secret doctrine and ancient mysteries is this same philosophy of fire, symbol of God, life of love. In the work before the reader, quotations have been made from the secret science of the greater fraternities which were instrumental in shaping the religious beliefs of the people. Not only one, not only one not thus considered is Zoroaster and his doctrine. The only one not thus considered is Zoroaster and his doctrine. I'm sorry. <laughs> Before the time of Zoroaster, the Persians, like the early Egyptians, worshipped in the open air long after other nations had constructed temples, as they considered the broad expanse of heaven and as a sublime covering for their devotion of the deity. Their places of sacrifice were much like those of the northern nations of Europe, composed of circles of upright stones roughly hewn, the abominated images and worshipped the sun and fire. They abominated images and worshipped the sun and fire as representative of the omnipresent deity. The Jews, even though they did not belong to the inner circle of any priesthood and therefore merely followed the exoteric, exoteric religious ceremonies, were not exempt from the worship of fire. God appeared in the, in the cherubim over the gate of Eden as a flaming sword, and to Abraham as a flame of fire, to Moses as a fire in, in the bush of Horeb, and to the whole assembly of the people in Sinai when he descended upon the mountain in fire. Moses himself told them that their God was cons a consuming fire, which was re-echoed more than once, and later the Hebrews were weak enough to worship the material fire in lieu of the invisible and eternal God. Zoroaster succeeded in persuading them to enclose their sacred fire altars in covered towers because being on elevated and exposed hill, the fire was liable to be extinguished by storms. These were circular buildings covered with domes, having small openings at the top, allowing the smoke to escape. 
Undoubtedly, a difference of opinion existed between the various sects, as illustrated by the following story. Quote, A Jew entered a Parsi temple and beheld the sacred fire. What, said he to the priest, do you worship the fire? Not the fire. Not the fire, answered the priest. It is to us the emblem of the sun and of his genial heat. Do you then worship the sun as your god? questioned the Jew. No, know ye not that this luminary also is but a work of the almighty creator? We know it, replied the priest, but the uncultivated man requires a sensible sign in order to form a conception of the most high, and is not the sun, the incomprehensible source of light, an image of the invis invisible being who blesses and preserves all things. Do you people then, rejoin the Israelite, distinguish the type from the original? They call the sun their god, and descending even from this to a baser object, they kneel before an earthly flame. Ye amuse the outward, but blind the inward eye. And while ye hold to them the earthly, ye draw from them the heavenly light. Thou shalt not make unto thyself any image or likeness, how do you designate the Supreme Being? asked the Parsi. We call him Jehovah Adonai, that is, Lord who is, who was, and who will be, answered the Jew. Your appellation is grand and sublime, said the Parsi, but it is awful too. A Christian then drew nigh and said, We call him Father. The pagan and the Jew looked at each other and said, Here is at once an image and a reality. It is a word of the heart. Therefore, they all raised their eyes to heaven and said with reverence and love, quote, Our Father, unquote. And they took each other by the hand, and all three called one another, quote, unquote, Brother. Now, I just want to break for a quick second on this little story. There are, there, mm, there are various things here which coincide to the Phoenicians big time with this. Adonai. Adonai is a Phoenician, Adonis, is a Phoenician god who is resurrected in the spring and is a god of fecundity, of creation, of, you know, of, of life. And uh, this is another one of these Jesus characters in history. So this is very interesting that they add him here and how they put... Jehovah and Adonai as, as as almost the same thing. This is very interesting. And also another another clue here is the conception of the Most High, the Most High God um, in Phoenician is called El. And uh, well, this connects very much to all this. And we will see more of that in the near future when I get to it. The names of the various religious systems may be different, but the underlying principle, when actually understood, is ever the same. It is immaterial what exoteric system of religion may be studied. It will always be found that God is, quote, unquote, consuming fire. In the ancient mysteries, this is even more a fact because therein we are taught what this living fire actually is, where it is, and how and whence man received it. Ever since the most ancient times, divine wisdom has taught the same doctrine through the lips of the wise. Hermes Trismegistus, Confucius and Zoroaster, Buddha and Jesus, who became the Christ, Socrates, St. Martin, and Jacob the Bo Bowman, Theophrastus, Periclesus, Periclesus, Cornelius Agrippa, Shakespeare, Stoppenhauer, P.B. Randolph, M.D., James R. Phelps, M.D., Freeman Ardell, blah, 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 and others, they have all taught the same truths, more or less complete, because they were all from the same school of philosophy. And each one of these teachers clothed the truth, truth that they had in a form best suited his own understanding and best adapted to the comprehension of his disciples and the times in which they lived. None may claim these doctrines as strictly their own. Even Jesus said, quote, These doctrines which I teach are not my own, but it is the truth which teaches them through me. He that teaches his own doctrine and theory speaketh of himself. He is acting under the impulse of earthly ambition and seeketh his own glory and not the glory of God. But he that seeks to glorify not himself but God by giving expression to the truth of which he is conscious is true and no evil can be in him. Live so that you may know the truth, not by external appearances and argumentation, but by its own inherent power. 
Be true and you will know the truth, unquote. The organism of man, he said, resembles a kingdom, its capital is the mind, and its temple the soul. In that capital and temple there are as many false prophets as there are in Jerusalem. There are the Pharisees of the sophistry and false log logic, credulity and skepticism, and the scribes are the prejudices and erroneous opinions engrafted upon the memory. Do not listen to what these false prophets say, but listen to the voice of wisdom that speaks in your heart. For verily I say unto you, the temple, built of speculations which the scribes have erected, will be destroyed, and not one of the dogmas and theories of which it has been constructed will remain when the day of the judgment appears. See the truth enters your heart, bearing the palm leaf, the symbol of peace. Even Jesus made use of symbolism, and this is absolutely the symbol of Phoenicians, by the way. Phoenicia means the land of the palms. Keep that in mind. Let it abide in you and abide yourself in the truth. There is no other worship acceptable to the universal God, but to keep his commandments, which he reveals to you through the power of divine wisdom, whose voice speaks in your higher consciousness. Love one another, and as you grow in unselfish love, so will you grow in wisdom. Open your hearts and see the image of the true God within them. He is not to be found in man-made churches, and if anyone tells you Christ is in this church or he is in that one, do not believe it, but seek for God within your own heart. Um, and here there's a little asterisk, so I'll go down here real quick. This is the basic fundamental doctrine of the Rose Cross. Ye are the temples of the living God, consequently man must build in and include within his being all things. And uh, another thing that's interesting about the Rose Cross and the Rosicrucian, and the fact that they use the rose, is that uh, um, in, the, in the video I did of the second tablet of Thoth, um, he literally talks about using that same metaphor of the growing of the soul as a, as a flower becoming opened into, to the fullness of light. So keep that in mind. <laughs> Open your hearts and see the image of the true God within them. Yeah. He is not to be found in man-made... Oh, okay, I can't avoid that. Thus, Jesus agrees with the fundamental doctrine of the secret school and with the instructions given in the fraternity of the present day, namely that man is the product of his own thoughts. He is that which he creates in himself by the way he thinks and lives. For his external form is merely the outward symbol of his internal character, modified by the want of plasticity of the gross matter composing his body. For this may not be sufficiently plastic to change in form as, repeatedly, as rapidly as his thoughts. The matter composing the soul is creative. If our thoughts are continuous, continually low and vulgar, the soul will become correspondingly degraded. But if we continually... If we continually thinking of a high ideal, our ideal will make will take form from within ourselves. If we are satisfied with the belief in a historical Jesus without seeking to bring to birth or to enable a Christ to grow within ourselves, such a belief will not merely be useless, but will even be an impediment in our way towards perfection. Now, there's a lot to unpack right there. I'm not going to unpack it right now. I'm just going to keep reading this, okay? But... This last paragraph is really important <laughs> because this is very much right th right here. This paragraph right here, this whole paragraph right here, this paragraph is talking basically about what quantum physics has been discovering about the nature of consciousness. So the object of the secret science, and this is in 1907, long before, this is before quantum physics was invented. Not long before, though. I'll just point, point that out. The object of the secret, do sacred science, the ancient mysteries, the secret doctrine of initiation, and of all living religions is one of the same thing that is to ennoble mankind to awaken in men a realization of the divinity of, of the soul within themselves. Religion in its theoretical aspect means a real knowledge and of the relations which exist between man and the external source from which the soul 
emanated in the beginning, religion in its practical aspect means the union of man with God, a union that cannot be affected through the external interference or permission of a clergyman, no matter how holy he may be, but must be affected by the power of internal will and desire. There is no real knowledge to be attained by merely learning a theory. There is no real understanding unless the theory is confirmed by practice, in other words, by living the doctrine believed. And this is going to be a huge crux of what this channel is truly about, okay? I want to bring you guys step by step to this because in many ways how this talks about initiation, I, you can't, I can't just shovel all this stuff in your face at once. You, you have to take it in levels. Otherwise, you won't really, all the dots won't connect for you in this amazing corner, this amazing uh, picture, this gigantic mosaic of all things that create one basic message and understanding, which will really, if you understand it and you start to use it, it, it you know, you don't need, you won't need any validation from any person anymore, anywhere ever again, because you'll know. And you'll see it, like Jesus says, you'll know them by the by their fruits, and that is a very true statement. So back to this, because we have only about two more pages left, and I got it run. Such knowledge is acquired neither by the study of theology and philosophy nor by moralizing. It does not depend on any theoretical information in regard to terrestrial or celestial things, or nor can spiritual uh, soul regeneration be attained by leading a virtuous life for fear of the consequences that are likely to follow if we indulge in evil thoughts and acts. It can be attained only by a realization of the truth within our own selves. There is nothing to prevent any man from arriving at such comprehension except the lower tendencies of his moral, mortal nature. The process of regeneration or initiation therefore involves a continual battle with the lower self, and an unceasing fight between spiritual aspirations and earthly desires in which the soul must gain the victory over matter or ultimately lose its identity as an individual being, i.e. death and then reincarnation. All the boasted study of the science learned in schools contain but little real knowledge. In it is little of the absolute truth. It is merely relative knowledge and refers to the relations with, with which external uh, slash material objects bear to one another. And all this knowledge, however useful it may be, as long as we live in a world of sense, sensation, and matter will be utterly worthless to us when we enter the state of being wherein matter, as such, no longer has a part. The only true science, which is really useful to us in time and eternity in our present state, not less than in the future, is the practical knowledge of the regeneration of man. Authors herein quoted, and he lists a couple of the authors who I believe are all, every one of them are all Rosicrucians and Freemasons of some sort. Each one of these great teachers has been important to the present work as to the other, and equal credit is therefore due to all. Uh, we will be reading this guy's book, D.H. Philon. He wrote a really interesting book about Atlantis that I'm going to be reading to you guys later on. So, um, In the body of work, the text is not often interrupted by giving authors names and immediate connections with quotations in being the compiler's desire to give the teachings of masters with the least possible interruption of thought. If the, per if the work will be the means of opening the eyes of a few and will influence them to try to, quote, find their own soul, unquote, I will be satisfied. And this is why the word try is such a big deal. So written in... Uh, by Mr. Swinburne Clymer in Beverly Hall, Quakertown, Pennsylvania, December 27th, 1919. All right. So this will be the first chapter. I'm going to stop it here because uh, it's just a good idea if I do that. I think. What do you guys think? You guys think it's a good idea? I think it's a good idea. Seems like everything's working right. Um, so look, I just want to simply say that uh, this, um, you're not going to agree with everything that I'm reading here. And these are other people's books, okay? But I think 
one of the things about learning about spirituality is understanding one basic concept. And this, it was already applied in this book already. And that idea is this, is that all religions stem from basically the same concept. Um, we, as human beings, can't help to superimpose our own egotistical ideas to these things and then to differentiate these things to the nth degree and therefore taking out all of the some of the major things that would have been you know important for people to learn and uh, i will say this is that if we didn't live in this paradigm of uh you know i mean our entire education system has been bought and bought and sold to the rockefellers and the uh, those type of oligarchical elites of the united states uh, a long time ago in the 1800s um, they bought, they created the curriculums for all the regular public schools going through high school, and then slowly, one by one, they basically donated, built buildings, got their guys into uh, to each one of the major universities across the country, and um, and now they run these places. And so, you know, if you imagine what life would be like if people were not taught that you know things like darwinism for example which is darwinism has become like religion in so many ways that it the distortions in darwinism of how i hear people talk about it are incredible <laughs> and uh, a lot of people think like oh survival of the fittest belongs to darwin that absolutely was not ever coined by him so that was coined by his bull his, his so-called bulldog uh Adel huxley's brother and, uh, and the thing is, is that, uh, you know, these people, um, uh, these nasty people who are, who are shoving these ideas of materialism down our throats, um, many of them, I think a lot of it comes from the British Royal Society, and, which is one of the reasons why when um, Newton finally passed away and they went into his box of unpublished writings, um, they closed it again and, and put it away and until uh, I think it was like the 30s or the 20s or the 30s when his, like somebody auctioned it. And so a lot of this really esoteric and uh, alchemical stuff and the, the kind of stuff he was really looking forward to, which is essentially what we would call today quantum physics, he was looking for that. And they didn't, you know, but the thing is, is that they propped him up as the father of materialism. Which is why it's so dangerous to reveal the fact that he really didn't care about that at all. What he really cared was about the non-materialistic part of life itself. And that should really make you question um, our entire education system here. And I'm not saying that like you have to be a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or any of those things. You can be all of those things and still come to the same point. And I will just make a statement now and I'll make a video specifically about this. But... I, in the last 20 years, have gone through a very long um, journey to find spiritual answers. And when I finally reached some of these books, I had already experienced so much of what they're going to talk to you about that um, it really connects with me. Because I've been, I have lived this life. I have seen the fruits. I have changed the course of people's lives in ways that I can only explain as miraculous. And uh, I, know I might do some videos on some things like that because I think it's important to talk about those things and to talk and tell people what it really is to be, you know, alive in this world. And how do you really truly love people? You know, how, and, and then at the same time, why do you hate people? And we're going to get into the concepts of things like special hate and special loves and why both those distinctions are lies in and of themselves. So that's uh, part one. I'm going to wrap it up. Looks like we're about an hour here. Um, part one of the philosophy of fire. And maybe I'll come back a little bit later and read part two of the philosophy of fire. Who knows? <laughs> Either way, um, I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Uh, checking this out and um, you know take all this with a grain of salt 
the reason why I'm going to be dropping all these books on you guys in raw form is so that you guys don't have to read it. You guys can just pop on here, listen to me read them off, maybe a couple, maybe a couple exam, you know, a couple comments here and there, or whatever else. But all in all, I'm gonna make this into like a you know a good library of audio books of spirituality and history and things like that. So, you know, um, everyone's busy. You know, you guys got kids, you guys got work. You know, that's done on purpose because if you didn't have any of this stuff, then guess what? You would actually be able to do things like. The practical knowledge, you know, of actually like, uh, I'm sorry, by living, you know, by understanding the knowledge and then living by the doctrines that you believe in, because you'd actually have the time to do things like meditate and and go inwards and to be in silence and to understand who you are um, in revelation to the rest of life in and of itself and all the people around you. And it's really, you know, I think it'll help. The, the more you guys stick with me, the more I think you'll realize you will find the same type of things all over the place. Just like a fractal, you know, things, or like a hologram, um, the, the, the base thing kind of becomes uh, multiplied over and over and over and over and over again. It might look slightly different because of its form, but really it's the same thing. So, um, again, if you, uh, thanks for joining me at, in regaining the balance. And if you guys uh, want to kick a tip to me or give a donation, our uh, PayPal and um, in our Patreon should be listed in our description box. Otherwise, stay tuned because we have I'm going to be dropping crazy amounts of videos in the next couple of months. So uh, at the moment, I'm not I don't have a full time job, so I have a little more time to be able to drop this kind of stuff for you guys. But um, I do have a couple of res of uh, historical projects I'm working on that I'll be bringing to you, which are going to blow the lid off of our historical chronology and give you some really interesting insights with, um, uh, let's say, um, source documents. And in some cases, source documents literally from the time period that events actually happened. Now, all these documents will be in other, like in French, That's, I speak French and English. And so, my wife and I have been translating documents from the 11th, 12th to the 16th century. And we have a cornucopia of insane information to share with you guys that is not in our history books. and uh, But there it is, written in the crazy Gothic calligraphy and very old French and um, information that is there. Um, just out of reach because most people don't even bother looking at these kind of things anymore. But I found them a year ago, and I've been finding more and more since then, and uh, I'm really looking forward to bringing all that to you. So much love and peace to you guys. I will see you on the flip side.